This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this times two is the iPhone 10. Obviously, we have the uh, space gray one, which is kind of really more like black, and we have the silver one, which is really kind of more like white. First big departure in design for the iPhone in four generations. So it's kind of a big deal for iPhone people, right? And maybe even some people who are switch hitters and they're interested in both operating systems. This is the first look. There's going to be a detailed re review, but as you know, Apple got phones out to reviewers late. Then they only came out in the stores yesterday. So this is going to be first look. We'll have a detailed review. And by the way, I know for me, it's been a little bit of a canoodle trying to figure out which one to buy. Some of you might have the same problem. Should you go with the 8 Plus if you're looking for that big screen love, or should you go with the 10? I'll have a smackdown for that too. Meanwhile, we're going to look at these now. So here we have it, two iPhones, two colors. Now this time around the box doesn't have a color on it to let you know which is which. It just shows the front face of the phone, which is in and of itself striking. That's probably why Apple did that. It's pretty distinctive thanks to number one, the big notch there. And because this is the first edge to edge iPhone display, it's also the first OLED display. I, and they've gone somewhere between Samsung and the Pixel XL, where Android and Google are trying to go for that kind of sRGB neutral looking thing right now. And Samsung goes for the gusto, especially with their default adaptive display that makes colors very saturated, ultra zingy, although you can change that. That's part of a longer discussion. Uh, here we have something that's a little zingier than normal, but Apple's still shooting for that P3 color gamut. So what does that mean? Well, if you put it next to the iPhone 8 Plus, in this case, you can see the colors are really very similar. You're not going to see wild, oversaturated colors on the new model right here. So if that's what you wanted, if you wanted the Galaxy S8 or the Galaxy Note kind of super zingy, ultra woohoo colors, well, go get a Galaxy because it's just not going to happen here. That said, the good thing is that this is a very accurate display. iOS, just like Mac OS, is a color managed display. That means it's not like Windows where if you have a very high gamut display, sometimes Windows itself looks very garish and stuff. The, the colors are managed well here and the iPhone respects any embedded color profile in the media. So that means that the creator, be it a photographer, a videographer, whatever, they embed a profile, which they do, which we always do, it will respect it and you'll see it as they meant it to be created. So that makes this a pretty nice display. 625 nits, which for OLED is also quite bright. We have studio lights on here and yeah. Also more than ever, the icons kind of look painted on the surface. Oh, Apple's got that going. How about viewing angle shift? Well, that's something that's inherent to OLEDs. It's getting better and better. The old ones used to turn bizarre shades of magenta or blue, and now it's a lot more subtle depending on the quality of the display. Apple went for a super high quality Samsung display, so has that made a difference? So to that end, here we have the Samsung Galaxy S8, currently the apex of what Samsung can offer in, well, this size OLED display. Here we have the iPhone 10. So they both look pretty good. Now we have, uh, by default, True Tone is turned on on the iPhone, and that means that your colors are going to be kind of balanced to indoor light. Both of these are actually pretty good. There's not a lot of shift on these, and the iPhone really is one of the best, so that's good. Can it burn in? Apple already has a tech note to say, yes, it's possible. OLED displays will eventually burn in, sometimes only a tiny, tiny bit, sometimes more than a tiny bit. They warn you it's possible, so not to show the same thing on screen all the time forever. That's life with OLED. You asked for OLED, you wanted OLED iPhone people, you got it, so you got to live with that. Now, when it comes to screen real estate, uh, if you haven't, be sure, and you're confused about how much screen real estate you're gaining between the 8 Plus and the 10, be sure to watch my video, The Truth About the iPhone Display, iPhone 10 Display, so you can understand the, you know, the measurements that are involved in making one larger than the other or more functionally larger and usable than the other one. So to take a look at it, you can see it's the Goldilocks principle overall in terms of physical size. We, we got the iPhone 8, we have the iPhone 10 in the middle, we have the iPhone 8 Plus, which is the gargantuan phone. Now, when I use an, an iOS device, I use the Plus size I have for a couple of years, just like I like the Note 8, I like my big phone. So one thing I didn't like about the 8 Plus was how big it was. It didn't fit in most of my pockets. It really is a handful, even though I have big hands and long fingers. So that kind of offsets the fact that I feel like I'm losing screen real estate. I think you can see in the comparison here, 
Now, it's going to depend on whether an app is optimized for the iPhone 10. If it's letterboxing, then functionally you're going to see pretty much the same that you might see on an iPhone 8, say for some games that have letterboxing on the sides and even on the top and the bottom. If it is optimized for the wider screen, then you're going to get more content. But here's where things get a little bit sticky. That 16 by 9 aspect ratio. The reason that became popular in phones, and we moan when Apple was slow to adopt that and they finally did, is because that's the standard format that cameras capture, other than for blockbuster feature length films that might be filmed in anamorphic anamorphic widescreen, even wider. Everything is 16 by 9 on your TV, the YouTube videos, all that stuff. That's what cameras record in. So it made sense for the screens that you use to consume that content, your TVs, your smartphones, your tablets, your laptops, to go with that too if you're going to be watching a lot of video. So now that we have the super duper widescreen iPhone 10 here, it doesn't match any popular content format right now. So you have a lot of wasted space on the sides if you're consuming video. And sometimes if you're looking at photos too, which are usually four by three, two by three, or 16 by nine. So your sense of how big the screen is or isn't is gonna depend on whether you're using this mostly to look at pictures, to watch videos, that sort of thing. Or if you're reading on a web page where the extra real estate really does come in handy. And you know, obviously people do that also reading eBooks and that sort of thing. So. Just like in my video where I talked about the true size of the iPhone screen, you can see here that the iPhone 8 Plus is the wider phone. In fact, it measures, I measure the old fashioned wooden ruler right here, and it is 69 millimeters in terms of width, the iPhone 8 Plus. The 10 is only 62 millimeters. So that's why you might feel like it's a smaller screen if you're coming from a plus size. Of course, the length is quite a bit longer on the iPhone 10. And again, it gets into what aspect ratio you prefer. I leave that one up to you. In terms of looks and aesthetics, it's hard to fault other than the weird on notch, which you do sort of get used to on the display. It's hard to fault the looks of this device. If you get the the white one, let's just call it white. It's really not very silver. You get the nice glass back, just like you would on the eight series phones right here. And you have this nice shameless stainless steel. But if you go with the black one, you get a kind of a dark stainless look, which is also attractive and different. Anyway, these are very nice looking phones. You still have a camera hump. That's the price we pay for the more sophisticated cameras. They do take up more space. The essential phone, it used an older sensor just to keep that flat back. So there's a challenge there. Not that it can't be done. Samsung has managed to do that again. It's always Samsung fighting there. Which of these do you think is more attractive from the back? You know, I still think that this year's gold, or it's a really a pinky gold, is really a very attractive phone on the 8 series. But other than that, the no bezel design always is going to win, aesthetically speaking. No headphone jack, you already probably knew that. You do have stereo speakers, one firing on the bottom, the other one is in the earpiece of the phone. New inside the box. We usually don't do the unboxing thing. I've never quite understood the, the whole, look, here's the box. I think the most fun thing about unboxing is when you own it and you do it yourself. But in the box, you get the usual charger. You still get the little lightning to 3.5 millimeter headphone jack for your other headphones because this time, you don't need it. What you have here is an actual lightning connector on your earbuds in the box. So you don't have to carry the dongle if you're an earbud user. Of course, you can also go with the AirPods, which actually do rock in terms of usability. The sound quality is okay. It's nothing to, to speak of, but the usability of these AirPods is really pretty awesome. I guess Apple is hoping everybody's going to move over to the wireless ones and just ignore the wired headphones. In terms of performance, you, you've got the same internals as you do on the regular 8s. So you're not gaining anything there. When it comes to the camera, you get portrait mode from the front camera because now you have the whole fancy sensor apparatus and stuff on the front for the Face ID system. So Apple can do more with the front camera. That means you can do nifty pictures like this here portrait I took of myself using the front camera. Now you're still going to have the distortion typical of front cameras, which are going to accentuate your nose and have a little barrel distortion. To People with big noses like mine, oi. But it still is pretty neat to do. The more exciting thing versus the plus, though, is the fact that you have optical image stabilization on the rear portrait camera lens, too, not just the main ones. So that means better low light portrait photos, or in some cases where before it said, oh, no, the light's too low, it'll let you do it now. So that's pretty nice. Now, Face ID really is probably the most exciting about this phone, honestly. You know, when Apple started using Touch ID, they weren't the first one to use a fingerprint sensor. Motorola phones had them ages ago, laptops had them, but they made it so fast, so seamless, so easy, and integrating into things like making purchases online, uh, on, not just unlocking your phone, for example, even Apple Pay, all that sort of thing that, well, everybody had to do it, and it made the industry get better at fingerprint scanners fast. I think the same thing is going to happen with Face ID. It may be harder, because that is a very complex technology. When you're shooting 30,000 dots at 
somebody's face to model it and the depth of it and all that kind of thing to get it right. Other than twins and close siblings, you know, can fool it. But other than that, it's really remarkable. It's, it's as easy as you pick it up, you look at it, it's already unlocked. And then you do still have to swipe, I suppose, in case you just wanted to see notifications on your screen or something like that. I, it's it's uncannily good and fast. And so far it's worked in the dark for me or near dark, not pitch black dark, but moonlight through the window kind of dark. It's good in outdoor sunlight as well, bright light. It's just phenomenal stuff. So now you're going to use that. If you're going to be making purchases on the phone, you just look at the phone instead. If you're using Apple Pay, that's cool stuff. Uh, the the challenge is taking away that fingerprint scanner, and I was a little leery of it too because it works so well. It became such a seamless habit to use on an iPhone is you don't have that fingerprint scanner anymore. And I'm starting to feel like it's okay. Some things I'm not too thrilled about. For example, you have a power button right on the side here that turns the phone on, but does not turn the phone off. If you press and hold it, it launches Siri. Uh -huh. So you have to press and hold the volume up and the power button if you want to shut it off, which brings that shutdown screen that also has the SOS function and eventually calling 911. So I have actually managed to hold it too long and have it start doing the whoop, whoop, whoop siren thing. That could be better. I don't think anybody should ever mess with the power button. The rest of the gestures you learn pretty quickly. The, the whole swipe up to do go home. Well, we're actually at home right now. The whole swipe up to go home like that. Swipe up and hold to do multitasking. If you want to see your control center, you swipe there. And that's where you'll see your battery percentage as well. If you want to see your notifications, you swipe there. It became ingrained habit in a half a day for me. I was really surprised. I thought it was going to take me longer to wean myself off of Touch ID. And now when I go back to the old iPhone, it's kind of like, really? I have to press the button, the fingerprint scanner? Ooh, this feels, ew, feels a little old, outdated. So I think that's going to be the most important advancement that this phone offers, not the edge to edge display, which everybody else has been doing. And at some point we might even have a return to bezels as people start to appreciate what they offer, things like front-facing stereo speakers, speakers and other things like that. But I think Face ID is the future of smartphones and probably laptops too when they get it right. And I know some of you are saying, oh man, Samsung already has face recognition. The face recognition on Samsung phones currently is not even secure enough to use with Samsung Pay. So that don't count. This is a lot more secure. You can fool the Face ID on a Samsung using a picture of yourself does have the iris scanning and that's not bad. Not as fast as this, not as sophisticated probably as this either. So yeah. Anyway, there's going to be a full review. Don't worry. I'm going to have more things to say as I live with this, both the pros and the cons of it. But now you've got my initial thoughts. I do like the phone a lot. And as somebody who has an eight plus and has been longing for something more pocketable, I think I'm willing to give up on the, the normal aspect ratio and the screen real estate just to get this more modern device and something that really fits in the pocket and a hand much better. And there's going to be a comparison between, like I said, the 8 Plus and this, in case you're on the fence about that, and of course against the Galaxy Note 8 too. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.